This week on Disaffected, what is parental love? And if parents have rights, do they also have duties? We'll talk about our modern conception of children as lifestyle accessories and our cultural inability to recognize that parents have duties and responsibilities to children, not just rights. Then we'll be joined by California father Ted Hudako, who has had his parental rights stripped by a family court. The judge, herself a trans mom, has enabled the child's mother to sterilize Ted's child, and he's not legally allowed to do anything about it. We'll round out the show with a look at the headlines and some viewer mail, and that's all coming up on Disaffected. Welcome to Disaffected from Burlington, Vermont. This is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. People from childhoods of abuse and neglect struggle to answer one question. Did my parents love me? Even adults who have a lifetime of abusive encounters with a parent and who come to me for coaching often say, I know she loved me just in her own way. Women whose mothers told them as little girls that they never amount to anything, and by the way, stop talking so much, these women tell me that they know their mothers actually love them. Men whose fathers only touched them to blister their backsides with a belt will tell me that they know their fathers really cared after all. I ask them how they know, and that's when there's a long pause, and it can get squirmingly uncomfortable. Well, she's my mother, or he's my father, is usually the first thing people say. He just has problems showing me love the way other parents do. When I divorced my abusive mother seven years ago, I learned the truth about something that I had run from all my life. My mother did not love me. This was my most deep-rooted and long-standing fear, and it turned out to be true. The need for a mother's love for a child is so natural and so primal that it's hard to understand why, it's not hard to understand actually, why a person would shield himself or herself from seeing the truth. The lack of that love causes permanent, lifelong damage. Permanent. Not all of this can be fixed, even if progress can be made. Early childhood matters. A year or two later, after the break with my mother, I asked my therapist if he thought my mother had ever loved me. You see, because even after I saw the truth, I was still wheedling to find a way to make it not true. This is what he said. Your mother isn't capable of love. People with her psychopathology can't love. They don't have the equipment for it. And I want to clarify a term there. Um, psychopathology is just another way of saying mental illness broadly. It does not mean being a psychopath. So psychopath is one thing, but psychopathology is a broad term. Another term for it is mental illness. So when you said that, um, it was at the same time a dismal thing to hear, but a helpful thing to hear. Uh, dismal because it, it finally closed the door on my forlorn hopes. It was helpful because it reaffirmed to me that it wasn't personal, if you will. It wasn't that I'd been born bad, and it wasn't that I was an especially bad child. It wasn't even that my mother didn't want to love her children necessarily. I think sometimes she did, and I think sometimes she believed that she did love her children. Sometimes. But she did not because she cannot. Like most of the abusive parents politicians, celebrities, and influencers that we talk about on this show, um, the, the really abusive ones. My mother has a, what's called a cluster B personality disorder. She has an equal dose of, I think, both borderline and narcissistic personality pathologies. Her selfish, frightening, and destructive outbursts, I think, were largely driven by the narcissistic component. But her daily flips, her hourly and daily flips between histrionic, performative maternal emotion, and then the flip to the cold dismissal of her children's feelings and needs, that comes, I think, from her borderline traits, borderline being unstable. Come emotional rain or shine, my mother liked to sit in her recliner or on her favorite spot on the couch and hold court with endless cigarettes and mugs of coffee. 
On one evening, I could be your favorite golden boy who sat up late at night talking to her like we were gal pals. <laughs> Most conversations were the same, night after night. Everyone had done her wrong, especially her own mother. The same stories were told and retold, night after night, decade after decade, like each recitation was the premiere of a new work. But in her more maternal moods, she would, she would cry, and she'd tell me, even though your father wanted me to have an abortion, I refused. I wanted you. You were a wanted baby. I wanted all of you kids. The only thing I ever wanted was to be a mother and have babies. Now, the, the purpose of this, I think, now was, even if she didn't know this consciously while she was doing it, it was to induce me to comfort her and commiserate with her and then to hold her and tell her that she was the best mother in the world. But the next evening, I could be back in the Queen's Court, but this time she was administering justice. The two hours with my mother on those nights weren't two friends gabbing. They were an extended sentencing hearing. My crimes against the dirty dishes, the laundry, the pile of mail that I accidentally touched, all of these would be recited back to me while she got angrier and more and more aggressive. She would say, you children don't respect me. You don't even see me as a whole person. You don't see me as a woman. You just see me as a mother, as your mother. God damn it, I am more than your mother, and I have needs too. I could have been somebody if I hadn't been tied down with three goddamn kids and no husband to help me. No, of course, I don't remember word for word everything that my mother said on January 6, 1982, but I've known my mother my whole life, and that's a really accurate paraphrase. And I know people whose parents, I have friends and acquaintances whose parents very obviously never loved them or even pretended to love them. They, they didn't even get the benefit of the emotional instability of a borderline mother. At least with one of those, there are some days when the emotional extremes are apparently positive. These friends of mine had permanent ice queens for mothers. They had a narcissism that was, uh, if you will, unleavened by borderline. <clears throat> The narcissist covers up the mirror so that you can never see yourself and confirm your own existence, but the borderline replaces the glass in the mirror with funhouse panes that distort and reverse the image from one square to the next. I struggle to understand whether one is any better than the other. Probably not. Is any of this behavior indicative of anything that we could sensibly call love? My mother's vacillations, the paternal beatings from my friend's fathers, or their mother's hearts of stone, their neglect. Is that love? What is love? There's a bit of wisdom that says love is not a feeling, it's an action. When you love your wife, you help her as a partner in your home and in the family, even when you're not feeling affectionate, even when you're not feeling elated, and when you're not feeling turned on. You continue to perform your duties as a husband and father, even when the initial romantic infatuation is years in the past. To love another person platonically is similar. When you love a friend, you, could, you continue to perform the actions of friendship, even when you're annoyed with each other, or when one of you is acting self-destructively. Sometimes showing love, sometimes enacting love, sounds brusque. Sometimes it means saying no. Sometimes it's telling a person that you love, very candidly, that they're on a bad path, even though you know that that will annoy them or make them angry with you in the moment. As a younger man, I didn't understand what it could mean to say that love is not a feeling, it's an action. I get it now in middle age. Our society does not. Our culture, I think, does not know what love is any more than I knew what love was. And I spent most of my life not really knowing what it was. I may not know what it is now, but I think I'm a little closer. Our society thinks it knows what love is, but it doesn't. We prioritize performative emotional displays over modest or quiet acts of service or reciprocity. 
If we say that we love someone and we make a grand gesture, then people take us at our word. Even if our actions most of the time don't match the script and don't measure up to the grand gesture. She just loves you in her own way. That's something that we tell a child whose mother stays out all night sleeping around while her kids are left home alone. It's what we tell little boys whose father went for a pack of cigarettes and never came back, but manages to send a check for $25 or $50 at Christmas. We lie. Mainly we lie to ourselves so that we can lie effectively to everyone else. And so that they can lie back to us. It's circular. We are in a pact of mutual gaslighting. To borrow from 20th century psychiatrist Herb Cleckley, we perform a parody of love. This is, I think, most obvious when it comes to our views about children, our views as parents and as members of society. What does it mean to love your children? The 21st century definition of parental love is, frankly, ghastly when you take a step back and look at it from a disinterested perspective. To love your children today is never to make them finish their homework because they might be annoyed. To love them is to deprive them of their abilities, their ability to grow competence by railing at their teachers if they get a bad grade instead of holding the child responsible for meeting high standards. To love children today is to push all obstacles out of their path and make sure that nothing makes them stumble. Countless parents love their children today by dressing them up for Facebook photos, Instagram photos. They look like a modern satire of the most glazed-eyed 1950s print ad showing a family in ecstasy because dad drove a new Ford home to the driveway. And celebrity parents love their children by putting them in front of cameras and telling breathless journalists the private business of their minor children and about the wonderful lessons that their children's tribulations have given and taught to the star parent. You can be seen as a loving mother in 21st century America if you sign a contract to sell your baby. You can make your child into an economic commodity as a mother by agreeing to sell that child to strangers and you will still receive sympathy and mommy good points or good mommy points. This picture here on your screen, this is a woman named Brittany Pearson. She's 37 years old and she has four children. Brittany Pearson signed a contract to sell what, have, what would have been her fifth child to a gay male couple who was in the market to buy a baby. The euphemism that we use for this act of human, commercial human trafficking is surrogacy, because that sounds better than selling your baby under contract. It is the practice of agreeing to get pregnant and carry a child only to hand it over to complete strangers, usually, not always, but usually, for money. It is to consciously deprive the child of its mother, willfully, planning, with planning and forethought, to deprive the child of its mother and, of course, its natural father. Unfortunately for Brittany Pearson, while she was doing her surrogacy during her pregnancy, she got a diagnosis of breast cancer. And she wanted to delay treatment to let the baby gestate as long as possible, give it the best chance at health. But the buyers weren't having any of it. Brittany claims that the unidentified gay male couple tried to push her into having an abortion. She also claims that they wouldn't accept a baby that she decided to give birth to prematurely because of the potential health risks to the baby in later life. So they didn't want her to do that either. And I'm saying right now, I'm moving to the term claimed. I'm saying she claimed because, forgive me, but I suspect that Brittany Pearson may not always be the most reliable narrator. Brittany says that she finally gave birth to the baby, but she will not tell the media or the podcast um, host that she's talking to. She will not disclose whether she had an induced labor, if she had a form of abortion, or just exactly what happened. All she will say is that the baby has since died. Now go online, look up this story, go online and marvel at the boundless sympathy from women that you see for Brittany how evil and wicked those narcissistic gay men were. Look how they're treating women, just like chattel or cattle. 
Brittany told the Daily Mail, well, actually, the whole quote here, the mother of four, who had already successfully completed one round of surrogacy before, said she was left feeling like, quote, a rented out uterus. Well, that's because she, Brittany Pearson, rented out her uterus. She did it twice. You know what else she did? She signed a contract to sell her baby to strangers. She's done it once with another child in the past. Now, do I find it plausible that a couple of rich gay men would be so callous as to order a baby and then refuse to take delivery of a defective product? You bet I do. I absolutely believe it. Doesn't surprise me at all. I see more of it than I'd like to see. But what I can't understand is just what it is that the mothers and the women online who are pouring out support for Brittany, I can't understand what it is that these mothers don't understand. What is it that they don't get about the fact that they're shedding online tears for a woman who decided to make money by selling her own child? Not a single comment I've seen from anyone about this case, man or woman, mentions the actual victim in this situation. The victim is that baby. The victim is the child. The most important person, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, in any transaction like this is the child. Nobody mentions it. Maybe you've seen a couple people comment on it. But most people, it doesn't even occur to them. And if it does occur to them, it doesn't occur enough that they feel moved to say it in front of other people. So forgive me for suspecting it didn't occur to them. This scales up to society. We have a lot of time to talk about the needs and wa rights and wants and desires and self-actualization and victimization of women and mothers particularly, always at the hands of some bad man. It doesn't even occur to most people that the real victim, of, as I said, is the child. And in surrogacy, we're, we're talking about selling a child. This is trafficking babies. How did we get here? And, you know, we've gone much farther than here. We've gotten here, but we've gone way past here as well. Now, a mother can prove her devotion as a mother by lying to her son and telling him he's a girl. She'll get social points for it. When she really wants to show how deep her love goes, she may castrate him with chemicals and a scalpel and literally remove his testicles. She'll be invited onto morning talk shows if she does. She'll be feted in the media. She's a brave trans mom. She'll be seen as a mama bear who will stop at nothing for her child. Now, grizzly mama bears can and do kill to protect their children, their cubs. But what they don't do is eat them alive to save them. And what are the fathers of these children? Now, consider Father Ted Hudako. It's been three years since he's seen his teenage son, Drew, and Drew is not his, the son's real name. The California family court system severed Ted Hudako's parental rights because his son, Drew, um, no, excuse me, because, because Ted himself would not go along with his ex-wife Christine's crusade to turn Drew into an experimental medical facsimile of a woman. We covered Ted's case a few months ago on this show. It was episode 108. We told you how California Superior Court Judge Joni Hiramoto grilled Ted Hudako, the father, in court. She tried to make a window into his soul to see if he truly loved his son. I'm going to read to you a little bit from Abigail Schreier, journalist Abigail Schreier's earlier expose that was published earlier this year in City Journal. Before she decided to strip him of all custody over his son Drew, before determining that he would have no say in whether Drew began medical gender transition, California Superior Court Judge Joni Hiramoto asked Ted Hudako this, quote, if your son Drew were medically psychotic and believed himself to be Queen of England, would you love him? Ted responded, of course I would. I'd also try to get him help. Back to the judge. I understand that qualifier, said Judge Hiramoto. But if it were, if you were told by Drew's psychiatrist, psychologist, 
that Drew was very fragile in that confronting him, or I'm sorry, confronting them with the idea that they are not the Queen of England is very harmful to their mental health. Could you go along and say, okay, Drew, you're the Queen of England and I love you and you are my child and I want you to do great and please continue to see your psychologist. Could you do that? Here's, well, you're seeing Judge Hiromoto. You're seeing her with a rain rainbow flag across her face. That's, um, that's an image that she chose herself. It was on her Facebook page. Self-authorship. Human books write their own covers. Why might a judge post a picture of herself, a family court judge, with such a clear political message of support for all things LGBTQ, which, like it or not, is probably the most partisan political issue in our society today. Abigail Schreier's article gives us a potential reason. Quote, on October 1st, 2019, on a post of her biologically male child dressed in earrings and makeup, Judge Hiramoto comments, quote, proud to be your mom, end quote. In May 2020, one month before Ted and Christine Hudako appeared in court, Judge Hiramoto's son celebrated on Instagram his one-year anniversary coming out as a transgender female. Next bit from Abigail's article. On July 30th, July 3rd, 2020, after Judge Hiramoto had first entered her provisional order granting Christine, the mother, full custody, Judge Hiramoto's trans feminine son posted on Instagram, quote, this is my first time wearing a bikini. Judge Hiramoto commented, beautiful, exclamation point, exclamation point. Now, thanks to Judge Hiramoto and a dubious court-appointed attorney for that boy, Drew, Christine Hudako has gotten her way. For months now, Drew has had a surgical implant that is slowly dripping what we call puberty blockers into his bloodstream. This, uh, the cancer drug Lupron is one of them. Uh, that's the drug that is used to chemically castrate rapists in prison. There are other puberty blockers as well that do similar things. They were never called puberty blockers before this, by the way. In fact, I, I think I should stop using that term. It normalizes this too much. If Drew has begun female hormones in conjunction with the so-called puberty blockers, it's very likely that right now as I'm speaking to you, he has been sterilized. And sterilization is permanent. It, we're not talking temporary loss of fertility. Sterilization means permanent. He will never be able to have children now. This is happening because of California's new law making it a sanctuary state for trans kids. The law allows minors to get chemical treatment and gender-affirming surgeries, what we used to call sex change surgeries. The law bars the state, courts, and the police, social workers, and all employees of the state from complying with out-of-state family court orders that are meant to stop the mutilation of a child. The law in California blatantly violates the Constitution. It allows devouring parents, mothers mainly, to flee to the state of California with their trans kids to get the care that they claim they need that is life-saving and affirming and to be protected from extradition if a family court in the originating state puts out a summons or an arrest warrant. California says, uh-uh-uh, don't cross my border, she's ours. When we come back after the break, Ted Hidako will join us himself to update us on his family's plight. We'll also be joined by my friend Brandon Showalter, a journalist at the Christian Post who has done more than any other working writer I know of to document this human rights atrocity against children. We'll see you after the break. Looking for a non-woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Welcome back. We brought you the backstory 
on what is happening with Ted Hudako and his son, Drew. Drew is not his real name. And now we've got Ted Hudako himself and my friend, the journalist, Brandon Showalter from the Christian Post. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for having me, Josh. Ted, I'd like you, if you please, um, give everybody a brief uh, synopsis of what the most recent status of the cases and your family is. I understand that it's been at least three years since you have seen your son. How old is your son now? 19. 19 years old. Okay. What's been going on since we covered this the last time? And the last time we covered this, we went all the way through Abigail Schreier's original story uh, that told your family's story. Um, so why don't you bring us up to date, please, on the sorts of things that were covered in Brandon's most recent piece in the Christian Post? Um, well, since the time of Abigail Schreier's story, but not mentioned in uh, Brandon's uh, piece in the Christian Post last week, uh, I did attempt to have the puberty blocker implant removed uh, by filing a motion with the family court, seeking uh, a hearing on an emergency expedited basis. Um, the Miners Council, uh, Dan Harkins in the case, filed an opposition to my motion and told the court that there was no expedient emergency regardless uh, of, of the impending sterilization at the time. The presiding judge apparently agreed with uh, the Miners Council and uh, denied my request for an expedite, expedited emergency hearing. Uh, the presiding judge did grant a hearing, but only six months later, uh, which would have been passed well past the time that the sterilization would have occurred. Uh, the hearing would have taken place just a couple of weeks before my son would turn 18. And had I even um, prevailed at such a hearing, it's unlikely the judge would have ordered the removal of the implant because the the, the thinking would have been that the, the, my son would have just gotten another implant as soon as he turned 18. So we took that off the calendar. So you are now in a situation, of course, your son has reached the age of majority and uh, you you have no legal control at all. You have no say. You Your say was taken away by the court while your son was still a minor. But of course, now now it's ended. That's, that, that's it. Um, yeah, that's correct. I would say the, really the only reason I continue to speak out about this is because there are uh, younger families, uh, other parents with minor children who are in the pipeline of this machine. And uh, I try to share my experiences uh, to help them avoid some of the pitfalls that I encountered. Um, I'm fortunate to have at least uh, some time to for, for, for the wounds to have slightly healed. I uh, have a bit more perspective and uh, I guess some acceptance of the situation. Yeah, well, unfortunately, yeah, we have to get to acceptance of, of, of really horrendous things because there is no other choice. And what you have been put through is nothing short of horrendous. Um, as I was refamiliarizing myself with your story and the story of your family, and then with Brandon's most recent piece, this is um, this is not metaphorical. I mean, I mean this very plainly. This is quite literally a Kafka nightmare. It's directly out of a Franz Kafka novel. Um, it seems to me, as an outsider and as an observer reading this, that it. I expect, for example, we talked about Miner's Counsel, the lawyer for your son, uh, Daniel Harkins. Uh, I talked about him in the last block, reminding people of some of his behaviors and actions. I expect the lawyers and the advocates in cases to do whatever they need to do within the bounds of, of reason and ethics <laughs> uh, in order to advocate for their clients. But I have the very strong um, perception and belief that the court system itself has already, had already, and has already decided um, that they were on the side of your ex-wife and the minor's counsel, that they were a willing and complicit partner in a predetermined outcome. What do you think? Um, I would agree with that. Um, however, if, if, you, if one were to look very closely at uh, the custody orders that were issued by Judge Hiramoto, uh, if you parse those carefully, it actually appears that UCSF, that's University of California, San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, Child, Adolescent, Gender Clinic, 
that organization actually was in the driver's seat as far as um, medical decisions. Uh, the language of the custody order states that if UCSF makes a recommendation, uh, my ex-wife can pick up and follow on those recommendations, but it doesn't really um, put her in the driver's seat, actually. Um, I, 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 of course, was less than an observer. Uh, well, it, seem, it seems to me that, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't wish to contradict you, but it seems to me that your, drive, your, wife has very, your ex-wife has very much been in the driver's seat. Um, she, she doesn't have to do any of the things that you, she, she's initiated this, has she not? Um, that's correct. Although, I mean, I, I suppose if I were to, to try to put myself in her shoes and, and, you know, imagine an argument she might use, mm -hmm. um, I, I suspect that UCSF used the suicide, uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, lever, the threat of suicide. Um, that's the, um, do, that's the, do you want a trans kid or do you want a dead kid line? Correct. Right. Right. Emotional yeah. manipulation. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll point out for the listeners, um, that's the kind of emotional manipulation that generally speaking, um, that's, that's, uh, that's often a marker of people with borderline personality, uh, traits and it comes up in systems as well. It's astonishing to me that we've got an entire culture and, and a medical system that is using the exact and literal arguments um, and manipulations that people with that compromised personality style will often do in order to uh, compel their loved ones to do what they wish. It's really disturbing. Yeah. Um, Ted, Ted, I'd like you to, um, I, I introduced this in the last segment, but I'd like to hear from you as a father what you think about the California law that that we are referring to as being a trans sanctuary state. So as a reminder for listeners, uh, these laws, uh, this one exists in California. Uh, it will It's soon to become law in Vermont, probably in Minnesota and several other states. These laws not only give minors, that is children, uh, legal access and at least in the case of Vermont, the actual legal right to demand so-called gender affirming care, sterilization, physical castration, mutilation of the body, chemical mutilation, they not only do that, but they also, and I believe they do this in violation of the, of the Constitution, the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution, they bar state employees, that includes cops, court systems, social workers, or anybody else, from doing anything to cooperate with an out-of-state court order. So, for example, if a parent decides to flee a state that makes it illegal to sterilize your children this way, the state of California will welcome them with open arms and then legally protect them from the court system in the other state. I've never seen anything like this. How does it look to you, Ted? Well, I, I went up to Sacramento multiple times last year when that when SB 107 was was working its way, uh, you know, through the through the uh, legislature um, and gave testimony against it. Uh, I, I even called out Senator Scott Weiner uh, for personally leading the charge. Uh, for this or for that bill. Um, I don't disagree with any of what you said. Well, Brandon, as a journalist, have you ever yeah. seen a law quite like that? It struck me as extraordinary. No. no. <laughs> this is absolutely insane. Uh, it What is really troubling, and I wrote this in the latest piece where I, I continue kind of where Abigail Schreier left off and highlight other dimensions of how entrenched this ideology is in state governments like California, where we have a fractious culture war emerging between red states that are now banning the transing of children. And you've mentioned this earlier, like if someone from a state like that, where they would make this illegal, Louisiana just did it earlier this week. Um, if they go to California, they are essentially, I don't believe it's hyperbole to call it kidnapping laws where the uniform custody, they, they've amended those policies such as the home jurisdiction will not have any sort of say and California will become the home courts. This, I mean, it's, it's absolutely mind blowing to me. And as if that isn't bad enough, uh, just last month, there was a state Senator who said that if you love your children, you need to flee California because of another law that they are considering AB 957, 
which would amend the uh, relevant state policies about you know child welfare that if a parent doesn't accept their children's so-called gender identity that they would then quite possibly be charged with child abuse ted is lucky to have custody of his one son that is not battling any kind of gender issue but i think it's entirely possible that if that law was in effect then he could have lost custody of both i mean it's not that's not too extreme to say so no. it's not even stopping as bad as this law is that you're talking about josh yes it's getting even worse <laughs> yeah no, it's well this this it's getting worse across the country um people are those who are are hip to this topic in conversation are are pointing this out they've been pointing it out but they're they're doing it even more frequently the united states is an outlier now all of this stuff, this idea of so-called, you know, the perverse and really profane, ridiculous idea of a so-called transgender child began in Europe. Um, you know, the so-called Dutch protocol uh, right. in Amsterdam that said, you know, we should delay their puberty uh, with these chemical drugs. This spread throughout Europe, then it went to the UK and it went absolutely nuts in the UK. I mean, um, you know, we they've seen the same thing that we've seen. Not only a uh, thousand percent, two thousand percent kinds of increases in the number of children who are being referred to gender identity clinics, but um, also this extraordinary explosion in the number of girls because it used to yeah. be in the before times uh that there were a very few boys who would end up in this situation and right. now there are, are are coming out with girls but we here in the united states this I, I i said on a show recently and an essay recently a part of me seems to sense that there's some sort of cultural turning point where people are starting to wake up. But I'm very uncertain about that because, as you said, Brandon, this is just barreling ahead. There, We may be talking about it more, but there are clearly zero consequences to any lawmakers, any yeah. of these. Um, they, they clearly fear nothing because it keeps going. Will right. there, can we do anything, either of you? What can we do? And I know you don't have the answer. I, I never ask my guests to tell us what to do uh, because people ask television show hosts, uh, you know, what to do. These things come out in conversation. But do you have any ideas about the kinds of things we might be doing to actually bring consequences that will stop or slow this? Well, so there's a lot in what was just said by the two of you. Um, first, I would like to actually go back to AB 957, uh, which which Brandon just mentioned, which um, would would instruct family courts to uh, apply, potentially apply a, a label of child abuse for a parent who did not uh, immediately affirm, uh, you know, an incongruent gender identity. And that that parent, you know, this, this is similar to what, what my position was, uh, would lose custody, but then also be affixed with the label of, of child abuse. Um, and as Brandon pointed out, not only lose custody of the gender incongruent child, child but any other child and become in, Ill, Ill, ineligible for being a foster parent or probably a number of other things, maybe even coaching child, youth sports, for instance, something I did. Um, it's a complete reversal. Excuse me. They are. It's a complete reversal. I, I'm sorry. I, I'd like to point this out for the uh, for the listeners to the show. This is another complete narcissistic reversal. It is is turning around and putting a mirror in front of your face. They are the obvious and actual abusers. These are people who are saying, yes, we should poison the kids. Yes, we should chemically sterilize them. Yes, we well, should cut their breasts or genitals. Josh, there's a, there's a lot. There's a lot. And, and um, um, I do want to come back to 957. Um, but a couple of things. Um, so there hasn't been a, a, a tremendous amount of, of awareness that the procedures that we're talking about um, are sterilizing to children. Okay. Um, thank you, Brandon, for bringing that up in, in your more recent piece. Um, a second thing that there is some awareness of is that um, these puberty blockers cause problems with bone calcification and acquisition of bone density leading to osteoporosis. Now, a, a third thing, which personally I, I, I find even more disturbing because if we're subjecting 
these these young individuals, uh, you know, to osteoporosis and the, the, the associated issues. With that, they won't necessarily be able to perform physical labor for their lives, you know, to, to earn a living. Um, but the same developmental effect that causes the bone density and the calcification problems also leads to brain injury. Um, and one of the artifacts that I shared in my case uh, with the Miners Council um, was the brain cognition and maturity under and voice uh, voice pattern under a case of uh, pubertal suppression, a paper that originated in, in Brazil, um, which discussed the, uh, the, the case of an 11 year old boy who was uh, given puberty blockers. And the doctors in that case observed, I believe a nine point drop in IQ. Mm. Uh, that's, and they went in and actually looked at a number of uh, uh, diffusion tensor imaging brain scans of a variety of patients and saw the same effect. Uh, and they raised a, raised a red flag. I shared that particular paper uh, with the Miners Council, Harkins in my case, and that was, that was poo-pooed. Um, he did not take that seriously at all. But if one actually looks at that particular paper and looks at the references, there are some animal studies uh, that are very key, in particular uh, the sheep studies uh, that originated in Scotland, um, the Huff and Bellingham papers. And uh, I, I urge anyone, what, parents... What kind of sheep animals, studies? Can you say a little more? What do you mean sheep studies? Um, this was done basically, I believe, at the Veterinary Science School at, at uh, University of Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, they determined, or I guess the, 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 the belief is that uh, adolescent sheep, an 11 month old sheep, male sheep, is uh, functionally or developmentally equivalent uh, to a 15 year old human male. Uh, so that particular study, um, and, and it, if you read read the experimental design, it was quite sound, at least as far as I can tell. Um, they had a proper control group, um, sheep that just reg ate a regular diet of, you know, I guess, grass and hay. And then they had a second group that was puberty blocked with Lupron and a third group that was puberty blocked, but also given an artificial testosterone. And after a period of time, uh, these animals were, were uh, run through uh, a maze and their times for navigating the maze was recorded. Uh, they were given uh, multiple trials through the ma maze and individual animals. And what they found uh, was that the animals that were uh, the, the ones that, that, that were not puberty blocked um, had the fastest navigation times. They also had the best memory uh, and improvement from trial to trial, which is sort of what you'd expect. What they found was that the puberty block group um, the group that was puberty blocked and had an artificial testosterone um, performed nearly as well in terms of navigation times uh, and nearly as well in improvement trial to trial. Not quite as good, but, but reasonably well. The puberty block group um, performed the worst. Uh, and you can look at the graphs and you know, the, mm -hmm. the numeric results are, are, you know, let's just say disappointing for, for, the, for the puberty block groups. But if you read the rest of the article and read the qualitative response of the animals as they went through the through the maze, uh, many of them had what they, they I emotional breakdowns, where they defecated or urinated themselves. Mm. Uh, the animals, might, in some cases, became so distressed that they attempted to leap out of the enclosures and injured themselves. Um, right. And my takeaway of yep. reading those two papers is that you would never ever give these drugs to humans under any circumstances. Right. Well, yeah, yes, but it it and it's it it is. I'm I, I'm sorry. It is intuitively obvious to any thinking adult that suppressing the puberty, artificially suppressing the puberty of a child, that's a maturation process. It's not only sexual maturation. It is that primarily. But it's part of the entire complex body system and includes the brain. So it is intuitively obvious as an assumption that if you stop that process, that you are in fact also stopping brain development and there's a, a very obvious question will that is that stoppage permanent right and we don't know the answer to that but well are, that's that's the, the the second of the two papers by huff and bellingham um went back and looked at at th that that collection of, of sheep uh and they retested them after cessation of of the puberty blockers mm -hmm. and they found that there there was an ongoing lingering effect 
yeah. um, that, yeah. that they didn't fully recover. So mm -hmm. that's that's a genuine concern. So, I mean, there's so much here, and I, I, I don't want to make this too complex for, for the audience, but, you know, I'll, I'll try. Um, try, yeah. try to not no, I mean, complex. yeah, no, I, I think it, it's very easy to understand. You know, it's, it's. I think, I think anyone listening to to what you just said will understand this. These are right, but the thing is, you know, it would, it would seem like why would anyone want to do this to another human being unless they were a sadist? Um, <laughs> well, or extremely, <laughs> extremely uh, ill-informed. Um, but you know, I, I, I've got to think that there are judges and legislators. Um, I would hope they're not sadists. Um, I would hope that they're they're educated people who are well intentioned. So maybe let's let's try to go with that as an assumption, okay? Um, and, and see where maybe they went off the rails. Right. So in the case of Judge Hiramoto, um, my my judge who issued the adverse uh, custody orders for me, um, we do know, and I learned many months after she issued the orders uh, that she has an adult male child who who transitioned to a female. Yes. And I, I believe her her child transitioned around age 28, maybe 30. Um, so one key difference in, in that case of, of, of Hiramoto's child, uh, he did not transition until well past puberty. He never ever would have taken puberty blockers. He just would have taken an, an estrogen. Now, estrogen's not good for men, and I'll, I'll leave that for <laughs> the readers to, to look up why, um, but cessation of estrogen, generally the, the man can, can, can come back. Yeah, can come back to to mm -hmm. a reasonable yes. level of functionality. That's not true for for puberty blockers. Right. So it, it's possible. I mean, if I want to give Judge Hiramoto the benefit of the doubt, um, it's possible she thought that this was uh, an innocuous, reversible process. Yeah. I, I I don't. I think there's plenty of other other artifacts, things she said, things that were uh, in the orders. Her refusal to to look at uh, the evidence, her adverse yeah. appointment of Harkins yeah. that that. I don't. I don't think that I really should give her that benefit of the doubt. Right. But the argument. Well, yeah, um, and and let me let me let me say about that um, very quickly. I won't contradict your your point of view, but I'll offer mine, and I think it's a little bit different. Um, uh, I I think while while you are correct, it's important to understand how much people don't know about this. We all have the experience of people being very, at first sometimes even our friends and loved ones refuse to believe us when we show them uh, that these things will sterilize. They simply refuse to believe it because it's too horrifying. Um, yeah. It is important to acknowledge that. I am convinced that it is also important to acknowledge, um, yes, there are sadistic people involved in this. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna name names, um, but I, I'm not gonna say no, no, I, they're not all well-intentioned. I don't believe that a lot of the big players, including the judges, no, I don't believe they're well-intentioned. They may believe that they are, but we have enough evidence, I think, that people, when you choose to refuse to look at a paper, when you choose to refuse to connect two logical concepts because connecting them will make it inconvenient for the political outcome that you would wish, that is a choice. That's a conscious choice, and it's a choice that doesn't indicate good intentions as far as I know. I want to ask you something, Ted, about looking back on this situation. We've got just a couple more minutes here in this segment. When you look back on this and when it started, and I don't know what, at what point in the family, I don't know how many years ago the idea of your son being transgender was first mooted. But when you look back now, do you believe that you made any mistakes or you overlooked any signs? This is, I'm not asking you to blame you. I'm, I'm asking for clarity and help for other parents. Do you see some things that you would advise parents to be aware of that you were not aware of when you started? Um, I'd never wanted my child to have a cell phone at an early age, and that was a point of contention with my ex-wife. Um, I thought a compromise was to provide an, an iPad, uh, which would not be you know uh, connected all the time on the cellular network. That would be limited to Wi-Fi. Um, he got an iPad at age at age eleven, um, and then <laughs> I, his mother gave him a, a a cell phone anyway, just shortly thereafter. So he had uh, a lot of internet access, probably uh, unfettered, unrestricted, uh, improperly uh, or improperly, uh, uh, let's just say, safeguarded. Um, that may have been yeah. one factor. Um, he he attended a, a, a Catholic private school, which. Uh, I, I mistakenly thought would would you know present more of a 
of a conservative uh, traditional uh, background, but yeah. uh, the gender ideology is is in full force there. Um, I think there may have been some exposure there. Um, I think he may have had, had exposure to uh, the Tre Trevor Project and maybe some other uh, mm. uh, forums like Reddit. Um, you know, yeah, uh, for, for, I, I, for, I, for listeners, the Trevor Project started out as something uh, to raise awareness about um, basically gay bashing, but is like all other organizations of that type, seems now to be focused primarily on uh, promoting the idea of trans kids. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is speculative. I don't, I don't know with certainty. Um, it, you know, I, I, if I had to do things differently, I might also have uh, more deeply vetted the first uh, uh, licensed marriage family therapist who, who worked with my son. Uh, I, I think he did some things to concretize this notion. Yeah. Um, I think the school also, the school and the school counseling apparatus also did some, some things to concretize this. Um, and because I live in the Bay Area, there's all these organizations seem to funnel uh, these, these, these children, the, these, these minors, uh, to the major gender clinics at, at either UCSF or Stanford in this area. All right. <clears throat> Gentlemen, I want to thank you both for joining us. This is, um, Ted, your case is one of the, one of the most difficult that I've read, um, and Brandon and his, his, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you are, uh, you two are connected. Um, and obviously it's difficult for an outsider to read, but, um, you as the father have been through, um, much more than most parents. And, um, thank you for what you're doing to educate other people about this and we'll stay in touch. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Josh. Josh. Looking for a non-woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Sigmund Freud used the phrase, the narcissism of minor differences. He was describing how people who really weren't that different would create conflicts with each other over increasingly petty and trivial differences. And we might call our societal approach today, <coughs> excuse me, the narcissism of comparatively minor oppressions. Despite the caterwauling from progressives, we have made so much progress in America in terms of how we treat the disabled, gay people, black people, other minorities, groups that we call marginalized. So much progress that all progressives and hard leftists can do now is to create a never ending struggle over less and less consequential harms. <clears throat> Take Vice President Kamala Harris. Is she concerned about the illegal alien crisis at our border? No. Is she doing anything about the abysmal state of public school learning and the fact that kids' test scores are absolutely at the bottom of the barrel historically? No. It's airplane bathrooms that are top of mind for her. That's the phrase, isn't it? <laughs> Top of mind. Item. Kamala Harris calls for action, <coughs> excuse me, folks, on airplane bathrooms. The vice president of the most powerful country on earth took to Twitter on July 11th to announce that the Biden administration will soon tackle the issue of airplane res uh, restroom inequality. Kamala Harris said it is, quote, absolutely unacceptable that most domestic flights lack bathrooms that are accessible. One Twitter user asked if the vice president was joking. Another one said, oh, was glad to see that Harris had what he said were her priorities in order. And yet another referred to her as being outrageously unserious. Pennsylvania Representative Guy Reskenthaler tweeted in response to our vice president, and he said that the U.S. faces historic inflation a southern border that's overrun, an epidemic of fentanyl use, extreme energy costs, and skyrocketing crime. 
Then he said, Kamala Harris's priority? Airplane bathrooms. A libertarian group in Arizona suggested the installment of new restroom facilities on aircraft would lead to increased travel costs. Oh, how could they? <laughs> they pointed out that seating capacity would inevitably be diminished and asked if Harris planned to, quote, deploy the government to fix the problem that they created. Ron Schmidt of Newsmax said Americans can anticipate higher ticket prices and should be prepared for airplanes with trans bathrooms that are large enough to fit a baby whale. <laughs> Pre uh, Vice President Harris later said that her tweet was referencing rules the Department of Transportation had drafted in 2022. Oh, well, that's longstanding. Rules that would see upgraded single aisle restrooms installed in aircraft. The newer facilities would be more accommodating to those with disabilities. We'll see how well this works out. You might be aware that California has a statewide reparations task force, slavery, slavery reparations. <clears throat> and that task force is supposed to figure out how many millions of dollars the state, and that is you, if you're in California, you are the state, the taxpayer, that's state money is taxpayer money, how much money the state and the taxpayers must fork over to each black resident of the state who was harmed by slavery and alleged past discrimination. Even though California was an anti-slave state from the day it joined the Union in 1851. The latest figure, by the way, that they're bandying around is $1.2 million per California resident. Item. Evanston, Illinois is the first U.S. city to pay reparations to its African-American residents. The city has a ba uh, black population of around 16% and payments have already begun. Robin Sue Simmons, a former alderwoman of the city, founded the First Repair organization dedicated for fight to fighting for cash payments to compensate for slavery and subsequent discrimination. And she said, this is only the beginning. Quote, we all look forward to seeing more legislation put into law and then into practice and then dispersed, she said. <laughs> Having carried out Having carried out a harm report, Simmons concluded that housing was the first area to address, and city officials raised $10 million through taxation on recreational cannabis. In 2022, 640 people received payments of $25,000 toward the purchase of a house, but now for the first time, black residents will receive cash. Again, this is Evanston, Illinois. The reparations proposals aren't acceptable to everybody, though. Some say they don't go far enough, while others insist that providing public money to people based on their race is both racist and unconstitutional. Rose Cannon, who has lived in Evanston all her life, said housing payments were insufficient, however. When that plan was finalized, Cannon said, quote, I want cash, before denouncing the recommendations, the final recommendations as, quote, racist. The fight for reparations at a federal level has stalled as the eye-watering reality of the cost becomes clear, and our favorite Democratic Representative Cory Bush has called on the government to set aside $14 trillion for reparations money. <laughs> Cha-ching! You know, there's a well-known bit in the comedy Family Guy where a trans woman character sits down at a bar, opens his phone, and starts watching pornography. <laughs> it looks like this. The bartender says, excuse me, ma'am, no porn at the bar. The trans woman replies, oh, it's okay, I'm transgendered. And the bartender says, oh, oh, I, I had no idea. Do whatever you want all the time. <laughs> Item. A Department of Defense memo reveals that transgender soldiers can opt out of deployments if they are undergoing hormone therapy. The leaked memo, sourced from the Womack Army Medical Center at Fort Liberty in North Carolina, states that service personnel, quote, will require up to 300 days to be stabilized on cross-sex hormone therapy, and then they will remain in a non-deployable status during that time. The document also outlines the medical procedures that trans soldiers are entitled to receive on the taxpayer's time. These include what they call top and bottom surgery, 
and these are euphemisms that include removal of the breasts from women, removal or refashioning of the external genitals of men, or the creation of an artificial penis in an operation called phalloplasty to be put on a woman. We've shown you this before. This is the one with the uh, gloving the arm, taking the skin off to create the, the false penis. Overall, um, trans, this is amazing to me. I couldn't believe what I was reading. Trans personnel are entitled to between nine and 18 months of leave to complete their transition. And during that time, they can use, quote, self-identified gender standards for uniform, grooming, fitness testing, as well as self-identified gender building, bathroom, and shower facilities, end quote. Now, you may remember back in, in 2017, I want to make sure that I get this in here. Yeah. Back in 2017, uh, President Trump banned trans people from serving in the military, which was, of course, a huge cultural kerfuffle. Um, and one of the and, and on the grounds that he said U.S. forces shouldn't the military shouldn't carry the costs of the medical treatment or risk having a military that wasn't ready for deployment and that needed that kind of ongoing medical support. About one of the first things that Joe Biden did when he became president um, was he reversed the Trump policy. And the defense secretary at that time, Lloyd Austin, um, told the media that the Department of Defense would take immediate steps to ensure that not only could trans people join the military, but that they could serve as their chosen, his word, chosen gender rather than be recognized as their biological sex. <sighs> You know, the military in the main doesn't accept diabetics because the goal of a military is to have a healthy, instantly deployable fighting force that won't need drugs and ongoing medical care while they're on a campaign. This is the military, right? They're very selective. At least they used to be very selective. And it's not just diabetics. Other conditions that require ongoing intensive medical support have also been used to, to screen people out of the military. Why are people who identify as trans exempt from this? It's an exemption from reality. It's not an accommodation for a disability. It's an exemption from having to live up to the standards of reality. You know, military campaigns happen in the physical real world. It's not it's it's not like somebody who says, you know, I may not be able to get around very much. So I need to uh, I need to work from home. I need a job that will accommodate me so that I can work from home. And you can have such a person who works at home from their computer and uh, contributes to the company and gets their job done just the same as as anyone else does. I mean, I have part time freelance work that I do uh, from home, you know, but. That's not what the military is about. You can't work from home <laughs> when you're in a war. Um, I don't know. We're going to end up, uh, we're going to close the show up uh, with some viewer mail. We haven't done this in a while. And all of you send uh, quite a bit of correspondence. Thank you. We love hearing from you. Um, and I take, I pick a mix from things we get in email and comments that people leave on the show on YouTube and other places. This one's from Mandy. She says, your show has opened my eyes to a confusing derangement that I, too, have lived all my life regarding my own mother. There are so many similarities to what you've described, being an emotional confidant to her, role reversal, inappropriate conversations, really young, drug abuse, neglect, it was all there. I've taken your advice and done some reading up on this, and I'm convinced now that my mother has an overlap of dependent histrionic and narcissistic personality disorders. We too grew up poor in a single mother household, and I adopted all of the leftist tropes as a result of being told in college that these traits of my childhood and family dynamics, they were all a result of larger societal structures with no emphasis on personal responsibility. Uh, thanks for that, Mandy. It's a common story. It really is. Um, and it's a common political and personal trajectory. It isn't universal, but it is common. As I always say when I we get these letters, I'm sorry the show resonates with you as personally as it does in one sense, but I am glad that it's helped you to see your history and your own family more clearly. So thanks for that. Next one comes from I'm listening 1137. And this person says, this is a comment on our recent episode called Rewritten when we talked about literally rewriting the past. And this is about the 
queers, the self-styled queers, openly pro uh, proclaiming that they are coming for your children. Quote, if they meant they will convert your children to kinder and more tolerant people, that would be fine, but we all know that's not what some of them meant. I've known gay people and lesbians all of my adult life since 1975 and have loved many of them. I've never felt that they wanted to convert to anyone, but that they just wanted to live their lives like everyone else. But then there were the militants. Yikes. Yeah, I know. Uh, that was my experience, too. There, there are a few militants and weirdos and creeps, but nothing, nothing like it is today. Um, to me, it's, it's, it's really hard to believe that so many people are coming right out and saying the thing that was, in my day, a grim joke that you tossed off sarcastically and ironically kind of to cover the wound over a little bit. You know, the, the feeling that, you know, everybody around you was suspicious that just because you were gay, you were gay, that meant you were a pedophile or that you wanted to claim children or convert children. We joked about this. We're like, ah, these stupid people. Why would they think that? And now, 30 years later, there, these people are actually saying it in, in our name, right? In the name of all lesbians and gays. It's, it's, it's maddening. We were actually focused on getting real substantive legal rights, the right not to be fired, the right not to be kicked out of your apartment, the right to, to form an economic and legal union with another person if your family, you know, simply couldn't function as your next of kin because they didn't want to have anything to do with you. Not, not so today. Last one we've got here is from We Are Light Beings 7156. She's commenting on the story I told you recently about my friend Holly, who was hiring a helper to come in and, and haul trash to the uh, city dump and, and do her laundry. And, and this woman who came over um, insulted Holly, wheedled, tried to get the job on the spot, and then tried to make Holly feel guilty for having the money to pay somebody to do housework that she didn't want to do. So in response to that, We Are Light Being says, when my second baby was born, I wanted to hire a housekeeper to come twice a week for just three months while I was adjusting to being a stay-at-home mom. I put out an ad and I got tons of replies. I picked five I liked and set up interviews. When the third woman showed up, I liked her so much that I decided to hire her. So I called the remaining two women to cancel their interviews. One of them said, thank you, no problem. And the other one proceeded to flip the F out on me. She said I was a terrible person for hiring someone without interviewing everyone. <laughs> and gave me a sob story about how she had canceled plans to come interview with me. She was acting as though I owed her the job. I just remember getting off the phone and being like, thank God that woman never came into my home. <laughs> yeah, well, light beings, welcome to new normal. And by the way, how could you do that to her? <laughs> um, we're coming up to the end here. I want to give a, a quick thank you. Um, many of you, so many of you were, were really generous and, and donated to the, fund, um, the fundraiser for the flood that affected my house uh, that a kind viewer named Linda set up. And I, I want to tell you how much I appreciate that. And many of you also, and a lot of you for the first time, actually signed up to support the show that Kevin and I are doing. And we really appreciate that, too. I'm not going to go on too long about, about this. But if you're interested in the update of, of what's going on with... Um, with the flood go over to the the page where you donated i'm going to have a video update tomorrow will all be all about uh, exacto knives cutting carpets and hauling them out again thank you everyone for your kindness and that's going to bring us to the end of the show but i want to remind you all the places you can find us visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com that's where you'll get our essays and musings uh, you can also visit us at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. If you become a supporter at either place, you'll get access to our private Discord chat server and backstage recording events. If you're on Twitter, you can find us at the handle at disaffectedpod. And don't forget to subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast app, your audio podcast app. We're back to releasing audio-only episodes, so be sure that you subscribe and you never miss one, and it'll automatically download. This week's episode talks about a new hate speech law that's on its way in Michigan. It hasn't been signed by the governor yet, but it wants to jail and fine people who deliberately, quote, misgender the special people of pronouns. And this has been Disaffected, which is not a Mark Goodson television production. We'll see you again next week.